Hello and welcome to the second video in the TBS Answers. Now, in the first video, we started to answer all the questions that we got in the very first video in the TBS Crossfire series. And unfortunately, I didn't manage to get through all of them because going through all of the detail takes a little bit of time. And we'd have a video that was the best part of 45 minutes long and everyone's gonna lose the will to live, including me, and my voice probably can't last that long either. So in the first video in the question series, we had all of these questions and we managed to get about halfway down. So now what I'm going to talk in this video about where we get the specs from CRSF using 1.3 gig FPV systems and all the way down to the bottom. In fact, I have one additional question that's cropped up in the intervening time between making the first and second video, and that's talking about RF modes, which is page 33 in the manual, which is all talking about force telemetry and manual modes, and it's a little bit of a black art, but I'll hopefully bring that to life. I do need to say a very big thank you again to the guys at Team Black Sheep, uh, particularly the top developers, people like Trappy and Remo, and those guys have spent quite a bit of time helping me wrap my head around some of the more sophisticated parts of the system and also making sure that all the information in here is technically accurate and as up to date as I can possibly get it. I'm recording this beginning of November and all the information in here is as good as I can get at the beginning of November, but the Crossfire software is changing so quickly in six, eight weeks, it will probably be slightly different. But hopefully this will answer the main pieces for all of you that have been asking. So thank you everyone for your patience for round two. The other reason that I've also waited a couple of weeks for the second part to come around is we are gonna talk about support for the QX7 and I was waiting for a couple of things to be in place that are now so I can actually talk about them. So the first thing we'll talk about then is where to get the specs for CRSF. Now that's the open protocol that Team Black Sheep have developed that sits between the radio and the module and also the radio receiver and the flight controller. Again, the system itself supports PPM, it also supports PWM, SBUS, all those standard connections that you'd expect. So you don't have to use CRSF, but if you don't, then you are introducing more latency into the system. But using those older protocols means you can connect TBS Crossfire system onto a radio using pretty much any trainer port and a PPM output. And you can also connect a Crossfire receiver to any flight controller that talks standard SBUS, PPM or whatever. To get the specs for CRSF, they're not publicly available right now. It's expected that they'll be publicly available around March, April time in 2018. If you raise a ticket on the TBS website, then TBS will share the parts of the CRSF protocol that you're interested in having a look at. Similarly, if you have any ideas for suggestions or improvements to Crossfire or the CRSF protocol, then please raise a ticket and let Team Black Sheep know as well. They're actively involved in improving the system at the moment. There's an awful lot of development time going into it and they're listening closely to community feedback. So if you have a great idea, do let them know. Next one is using 1.3 gigahertz FPV with the Crossfire. And the answer is, yep, you absolutely can, but the advice from TBS is to use 2.4 gigahertz. Now, the reason for that is there are four channels available with 2.4 gigahertz FPV. So you can fly more than one model at once, which is quite nice. And it doesn't interfere with 2.4 gig radio control systems. That's something that TBS have done a lot of development with. And through all, everything that I've seen here, there isn't an issue. Two of the channels in the 2.4 gig radio setup are completely separate from the bands that you'd use for control uh, for a 2.4 gig radio anyway. So that's the advice is if you're going to use Crossfire, use 2.4 gig. If you're going to use 1.3, then you've got a couple of things you have to be aware of. First of all, there is only one channel available on 1.3 gig FPV. So that means that's you flying and that's your lot. The other challenges you have in 1.3 is that you're getting quite close to not only the frequency that the Crossfire is using, either 800 odd, 900 odd megahertz, but you're also getting very close to things like some air traffic control systems and you're getting really close to GPS too. So because of that, you're gonna do things like add notch filters onto your 1.3 gig FPV receivers to try and avoid that cross-contamination of signal. So the answer to that question is yes you can use 1.3 but TBS and I would probably say yeah I'd probably use 2.4 instead. Next question was about Mavlink features. 
Mavlink is a really interesting one. There's an awful lot of support for Mavlink in TBS Crossfire. Now, if you don't know what Mavlink is, it's another telemetry protocol that's been around for a very long time and it's pretty bulletproof. It's used by the APMs, PixHawks, and in lots of other flight controllers as well. Now, the nice thing about Mavlink is that you can have it running alongside your radio system in a traditional radio and the connection is bi-directional and you have one radio connected to your PC or tablet running something like Mission Planner and then at the other end is connected into the Mavlink port on the flight controller and you're getting all the telemetry data back about the GPS position, the height, distance, battery, all that kind of good stuff but you can also control the model as well by sending it commands and you can even set it up with things like Ardu plane and Ardu copter, you can actually click on the map and those positions are actually sent to the model at the other end and the model will fly to those positions that you've just clicked to. It's a very, very smart system. Now, normally the way you do that is have a separate set of 3DR radios, either running at 433 or 915 megahertz. And that's the radio system that sits alongside your 2.4 gig standard radio that you'd fly the model with. And that's how the telemetry is sent and received. Now, the really cool thing with Crossfire is what you can actually do is you can configure two spare pins on your receiver to be a Mavlink transmit and receive pair. And those pins can then be connected to the Mavlink in and out of the flight control that you're interested in. And that Mavlink information is seamlessly sent back down to the ground station without any additional radios needed at all. So it's using that bi-directionality and low latency connection inherent in the Crossfire system to also package and send down the Mavlink data too. Now on the full size Crossfire, the one I've got here that has the little display on the back, you can then share the Mavlink connection via a Bluetooth receiver that's actually built into this thing as well. So by turning the Bluetooth on, you can then connect your Mission Planner tablet or PC, whatever you have at the field, you can connect it via Bluetooth to the Crossfire radio and then you don't need anything else. So you can get rid of your 3DR radios, you can get rid of USB cables, all that jazz. You connect your device running Mission Planner using Bluetooth up to the Bluetooth connection on the Crossfire and then the Mavlink is sent and received over the Crossfire connection as well. So it's actually a really, really clever part of the system and it's what a lot of Crossfire was being used for in the very early days people using it to control uh, surveying equipment, running things like PixHook and using Mavlink to keep track of everything and also manage the mission. So in Betaflight 3.2, you have full control of all of the pieces by running Lua scripts on your radio to maybe change things like PID settings and all that goodness. That should all work now in Betaflight 3.2. In Betaflight 3.3, there's a lot of work going into continuing to improve the CRSF support into Betaflight 3.3. Now that's not expected to be out until early 2018. And that will include some performance improvements, some code cleanup, uh, improve the bi-directional support even more, and also report the remote savings of settings as well. So if there is something at the moment that you're trying to do with CRSF, and the Crossfire system on Betaflight 3.2 and it doesn't work. It's all being addressed for Betaflight 3.3, but from the feedback that I'm personally getting from the people who are playing with the latest generation of the Crossfire firmware and Betaflight 3.2, they seem to be doing everything they want to and it's all working great. Next one to talk about is QX7 support. And this is part of the reason why I delayed the second video by a couple of weeks. Now the QX7 Lua script that enables you to access the Crossfire module and do all the settings is just about here. Now I'm running it on this radio and as you can see, I can get onto it and I can configure it all up. And actually that's what we were looking at when we were talking about those Mavlink features too. Now, apart from, I think, the very first version of the QX7 that shipped, the QX7s all have an inherent problem inside where they're using a slow inverter. Now, I think the original chip that they used in the very first batch of QX7s that were originally shipped, I think it was a Texas Instruments chip, I think it cost about five cents more, and those very, very first QX7s actually work fine. Uh, the later ones, and I think mine is one of them here, they downgraded to a cheaper chip that is a really crap actually there's no other word for it I'm afraid and unfortunately that will not support the high speeds that CRSF needs. Now there are two options to 
make that work. One is to upgrade to OpenTX 2.2.1 when that's out. As I'm recording this, it's still not available. Uh, looks like it's going to be a couple of weeks yet. You can install that and talk CRSF internally on the QX7 at a slower speed that is below the level that that crappy inverter will support. Or the other way to do it is do a hardware mod and replace that crappy inverter with one that's actually up to the job. Now there are a number of boards being worked at at the moment, part of open source projects that will allow us to do that modification and I'm hoping that TBS will actually sell one. If they do, I'll get my hands on one and I'll do a video where I show you how to do the installation. Personally, I prefer to have the CRSF stuff working at full speed and to overcome the limitations of a bad choice of inverter rather than run CRSF at much lower speed. Next one then is the model finding tips. Now there is part of the menu is this uh, thing at the back that talks about model finding and it works in exactly the same way as the video I did a while ago which is where you can use the directionality of the antenna to give you an idea of which direction the model's in if it's come down. Now that normally only works if you've crashed and the radio is still connected and that radio is then still sending out RSSI information and then you can use that to kind of get your bearing. It's exactly the same with the Crossfire system. What you do is you shield the radio with your body, turning 360 degrees, and the highest signal is going to be the direction of the model. There is a cute trick though in the full size receiver that Crossfire produce that it actually includes a battery. So even if the receiver is disconnected from the main flight battery, maybe because the flight battery has been ejected as the nose of the plane snapped off, or as the quad tumbled around, the battery strap let go and the battery was ejected, the receiver will still be powered and still allow you to do the model finding. And it'll run for a little while to give you a chance of actually finding it. So that's another cute thing. If you are going to use the Crossfire system with a full range receiver, you also have the ability to do your model finding even if the battery is ejected. Diversity on the system was another interesting question. There is diversity already. Uh, the full-size receiver has these two antennas that allow us to get the diversity reception. Uh, I think we'll probably see some additional antennas coming out in this kind of frequency range as the Crossfire community continues to grow. So I'm hoping that in a couple of months we'll be able to kind of show the latest innovation from the community around specific directional antennas and diversity arrays as well. But diversity itself is kind of built into the receivers as they are today. So the last one to talk about here then is the different RF modes. Now this is on page 33 of the manual. This is what page 33 actually looks like. And most of us have probably just skipped straight over that as the, and put it in the, oh blimey, that's a bit complicated box, including myself until I had to sit down and figure it out. And again, thank you to the Team Black Sheep guys for kind of helping fill in the background here. There's actually three RF profiles that the system will use and flick between depending on the setting that you have, whether it's normal or forced telemetry, and depending whether you have good or weak RF conditions. And the first one is high bandwidth, low latency. This gives you a full 150 hertz connection, full Mavlink or serial bridge connection. That's the stuff that we've just been talking about. If you fly far enough away or the area that you're in has really noisy reception, then the system will drop down to the normal update rate profile, and that's for longer rates. And then the last one is a low rate profile. That's only really kicks in if you have forced telemetry turned on in your crossfire settings on your radio. And that gives you an awful lot more range, but you can only use it with a GPS enabled flight controller that's running in some kind of GPS flight mode. So with the high bandwidth, low latency, you get an update rate of about 150 hertz. And when it flicks down into normal update rate profile, it drops down to 50 hertz updates. And then at the low update rate profile, where you've got forced telemetry turned on, uh, you can go a very long way indeed, but it drops down to an update of four hertz. That's four times a second. Now that means that you can't use it for any kind of flight modes apart from just providing updates to a flight controller that's doing the majority of the work anyway. Uh, it's handy to work on the bench. It's a bit of an exotic setting. The recommendation is leave it in normal mode and the system will 
switch between good RF conditions and weak RF conditions. It'll switch between the high bandwidth, low latency, and the normal update rate, uh, depending on the quality of the signal that it's getting. Now, I know the question that everyone's asking is, well, how does it switch over? What dictates it? And that is a really complicated question to answer. And it's one I spent a long time talking to the TBS guys, trying to get an easy answer that I could share in a 15 minute video. The bottom line is, it really depends on how noisy the radio frequency environment is that you're flying in, the way that the antennas are set up, tide, weather, traffic, all the usual stuff that normally affects range, it will absolutely affect the crossfire as well. The reason that the crossfire is doing this is as you fly away, you sacrifice bandwidth for increased range. So it has these different modes so that it continues to preserve the radio frequency link at the expense of a lower update speed. And to give you a rough idea, three to five kilometers in uh, ideal conditions is what you're gonna get. If it's a really horrific area that you're flying in with lots of RF interference, you might get only half a kilometer. The normal update rate, those weak RF conditions, that's, that profile will give you around about 10 times the flying distance-ish. And then that forced telemetry uh, low update rate, that four hertz, will give you about four times uh, more range than that. So that hopefully gives you an idea of the way the profiles work. CRSF is still an advantage over a PPM or SBUS connection. The advice from TBS is leave your crossfire on normal and just let it manage between the two, depending on the area that you're flying in. Uh, most pilots won't even notice the difference as it changes the update rate. So hopefully that helps with those additional questions. Thank you for bearing with me uh, on all that information. Thanks again to TBS for sticking with me and helping me get my head around this. If you have any more questions or suggestions for other videos on the CRSF or Crossfire stuff, then pop them in the comments down below. And hopefully in the future, as additional Crossfire pieces come out and updates are available, I'll do little supplementary videos as part of this series to keep everyone up to date. Thank you for taking the time to watch that video and particularly for watching right to the very end. We try and release a video on Tuesday and Friday and sometimes we'll release one or two extra ones in a week as well. All of the videos on the channel are organised into easy to use playlists so do have a look in there because if you're interested in a subject we organise all the videos on that subject so you can find them easily all together in one place. If you like what we're doing, then please like and subscribe and tell others about the channel so they can come and join as well. We're available in all of the usual social media places, particularly in places like Instagram, Twitter, and we also share all of our 3D designs on Thingiverse.